hope to our church family, to those that are watching with us today. Wherever they are, Lord, I pray that your hope would reign and that we would find great joy in who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to look at a few things this morning, and it's this week and next week is an introduction. I had 20 pages of introduction, so I decided not to try to cram it down your throat all in one shot. Now, I mean, candy, that's not so bad, but, you know, uh, I wanted you to see the joy and not get all choked up this morning. So we're going to break it up into two sections and answer this question, can we make sense out of life? What is the meaning of life? Why are we here in this world? Why am I so unhappy? Maybe you're feeling unhappy this morning. Maybe you're struggling with some thoughts. And you say, well, does God really care? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much injustice? We see it all the time where it's thrusted in the limelight. In fact, some of the things that we're seeing is injustice to real justice. We're like, this is crazy. How far injustice really have gone? How, how far has this gone? Is life really worth living? Maybe somebody that's watching or somebody that's here is really, you know, they're beside themselves. Is there, is, is this life all there really is? And we want to answer all those questions. And we, I believe 100% God answers those questions. And he answers them with a big, in a big way, to comfort your heart. You know, Ecclesiastes is one of those things. Uh, you know, Scripture is not very philosophical. And, very, in, you know, in, in Colossians chapter 2, you can see it says, don't even follow vain philosophies, human thoughts, human practices, but follow Christ. You've been given Christ, so follow Christ, he says in Colossians 2. But we see that philosophy and thoughts and answering the question why, you know what I mean, right? You know, when the kids get to a certain age, and I remember when Kedrick, you know, he's turned four, and he's like, why? I said, we're going to do this. Why? Well, and we're going to do this. Why? And it was always why. Maybe you've experienced that. Um, maybe you're a grandparent, and you figured out how to answer why. I'm, a, as a parent, so I haven't figured out how to answer all the whys. We're going to church. Why? Uh, we're going to worship God. Why? Um, because it's like, because <laughs> God is the most important thing. Why? And, you know, that's what we're going to answer. All of the meanings of a three-year-old and four-year-old's life. Maybe you still feel like that today. Aristotle was probably one of the, the biggest philosophers that tried to answer all of this. This Greek philosopher, his whole life, pouring through philosophy, probably one of the most renowned thinkers in this area of meaning of life. And basically, he debated among the Greeks for years and years and years and years. And Aristotle believed this. He said, basically, out of everything, he said, the pursuit of happiness is the most single most important thing in life, the pursuit of happiness. And he basically boiled it down to this, that a virtuous or good life equals a happy life. If you, you seek to be the best or be good and you are the virtuous person, then you will have a happy life. And of course, we know that no matter how good you, the good that you seek, it, it, it crumbles. The good and the, the good things of this world crumbles. I mean, just buy a brand new car. You drive it off the lot and the value just crumbled, Right? My dad always said, never buy a car off the lot. He said, always buy a five-year-old vehicle because that's actually the true value of the car. He said, then after a few years, sell it and buy another one. <laughs> and, uh, he, but he had this whole idea. He says, good is all relative. So even in Aristotle, all of his thinking and all of the stuff, all of the other Greek philosophers Everything that they sought after, it always crumbled. You know, it's amazing. I was, I was studying and I was preparing, and it's like, how do we answer these questions and the meaning of life? How do we deal with life today? How do we deal with the uncertainty of what we see happening? 
And I was like, man, it's Ecclesiastes. It's what God is right. And as I was pouring through it, I remembered a story from a preacher told me. He was talking about, it was a story about a policeman. And a policeman goes to this bridge, and there's a jumper that says, you know, i am had it with life, and I'm just jumping off. And the policeman said, look, he said, just let, can you just stop? And I'll tell you all the reasons why your life is valuable, and then you can tell me all that you're thinking. And let's just stop and think about this. And so they went on for about 15 minutes each explaining why, you know, he, the policeman was like, this is why life is so valuable. And then he sat and the, the jumper sat there and explained to him all the things about his life. And they ended up both jumping into the river. They basically decided, yeah, you know, all of the good that I've just explained doesn't really hold a candle to the reality of the world. Man, that's kind of sad. It's only sad if you don't know what is really true. And that's where we are. Let's read the first 11 verses of Ecclesiastes and let's get some sense of why this book was written, who wrote it, and why is it so important for us during this time to look at this wonderful, wonderful word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil in which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises again. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, and around and around it goes, and it goes the wind, and on its circuits the winds return. Boy, they returned last night, didn't they? Yeah, I was hoping that my my little dome was still there with my pig in it. (laughs) First thing I looked for this morning. Yeah, right? It goes from the south, comes back from the north, and here we are again. And maybe the power will go out. You never know. Verse 7, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the stream flows, they, they, there they flow again. All things are full of worrisome. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with the seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun is there a thing of which is it said see this is new is it has been already in the ages before us there is no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after There's nothing new under the sun. We were talking about that in Habakkuk this morning. I mean, we look at Habakkuk, we looked back 100 years ago, and we look at now. All of it's the same. It comes, it goes, it comes again. And the preacher says, there's nothing new under the sun. Let's identify the writer this morning. And there's there's some very important things to this study. And answering this question, is there any... Uh, meaning, uh, and can we make any sense out of life? That's what the preacher is saying. So who's the preacher? Well, he's identified as the preacher. You know the word preacher, uh, Koheleth, is basically, we get it, the Septuagint. uh, It's the Greek translation of the Bible. Uh, That's where we get the word Ecclesiastes. Uh, So the name Ecclesiastes is the Greek and Latin word for preacher. Preacher. And you know the word preacher here in the Hebrew is it's meaning a call to call an assembly of people together to publicly hear something. Preacher. Isn't that interesting? So he's identified. So here is the preacher. The preacher is called at the end of his life. Uh, this is towards the end. We get that if we read the whole book of Ecclesiastes. You know that he's lived long. He's exhausted all the things in his life, and now he's writing all of these things down for us to learn from. So he's gathering everybody together 
So to hear the conclusion of the whole matter of life. Yeah, he's identified as the preacher. Not only that, but he's also identified as the son of David. So he's, he's calling everybody to hear the word of the Lord. He's calling everybody to learn from God. And now he's identified in verse 1 as the son of David. So he's Jewish royalty. So he's important. He, he was born into an important family. He has some kind of status. So, he, you know, so there's something a little bit different about him. He's not just your everyday person, right? So, by the way, he's born into the, into the family of David, so he has status, but also God sovereignly ordained him to be where he is, and now he's calling everybody to gather together and to hear about the meaning of life. So the preacher, the son of David, and then he ends it with saying in verse 1, the king in Jerusalem. Did you know there was only three kings that reigned from Jerusalem? Three kings. Saul, David, and Solomon. Yeah, so we've already observed the only actual son of David who was a king who reigned in Jerusalem is who? Solomon. So here we have the preacher who is the son of David, who is a king in Jerusalem, and there's only one person that fits all of those, and that is Solomon. Think about it. Solomon had position, he had power, he had possession, he had prestige, he had prominence, he had pedigree, he had pleasure, he had popularity. So much popularity that kings and queens came from other countries to visit this most amazing king ever known to mankind. That's who is being used by God to present God's word in understanding this question, can we make sense out of life? Well, let's look at the theme. So we see who the writer is, but the theme of the writer what is the theme? What is he trying to get at? What is the whole book about? Well, I'll go to verse 2. Vanity of vanities. All is what? Vanity. Yeah. Now, I have this one blank. Vanity of vanities. You know the word vanity? It's habel in the, in the Hebrew. Habel, and it means literally what? A cloud of mist of nothing it's actually they would refer to it as a vapor or breath by the way when is the only time you can see your breath when it's super cold right we breathe and there is what i just breathed and i don't see what there you don't see anything but if you put your hand there you know it's there vanity of vanities nothing of nothing a breath of Nothing, says the preacher. Nothing of nothing. All is, it's like a math class. You know, A equal A plus B plus C equals what? I don't know. <laughs> I was looking at math today. I was like, oh my goodness. Some of the math that they teach today, I was like, how do they? It, it, it's just, in my brain, it's like nothing. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the preacher is telling us, the wise Solomon the wisest man ever to live on earth, the wealthiest man to ever live on earth. He, he's royalty. He's had everything. He's known every pleasure that you can ever imagine. And he's sitting here and he's looking at us and he says, all of life is just a vapor that can't be grasped. It is nothing. The idea is basically it lacks substance like nothing. By the way, this word vanity, Habel, is in Ecclesiastes 38 times. But it's only used in the rest of the Bible 30 times. It is one of the main ideas of this, this, this book. It's what God is trying to get to us. That all of life, and if we look at all of life, and we're going to look at the examples that he gives us next week, but right now he's just saying, look, it's all nothing. In fact, in 
in Psalm 144, verses 3 through 4. It says, O Lord, what is man that you regard him? O the son of man that you think of him. I mean, who is man? I mean, do you really, is it worthy of your time to think of him? But he says, man is like a breath, Habel. His days are like a passing shadow. His days are real, but then they're really nothing. It's all gone. You know, life is really like a metal coat hanger. You know the metal coat hangers that you use to, you know, unlock your car door and you use for all sorts of things. Um, we get them always from the from when we uh, dry clean stuff. And uh, but you, you ever untwisted a coat hanger? Have you ever got it back together? Not the same way, right? Life is like that. It just life comes unraveled and it never seems to go back. You can never get it back again. Right? Praise the Lord that God has the answers. God puts us back together not the same way, but in a better way. Right? That is so cool. Sometimes we, our life becomes unraveled and we're trying to make sense of it, and we're trying to ravel it back together, but God says, no, 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 no. I have a better plan. I have a better use for you. You're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, and the new has come. Let me put you back together completely and useful. In fact, I'll pour my Holy Spirit into you, my very essence, so that way it'll guide and help you to understand the things that nobody else can understand. Right now, you may be shaking your head at looking at the world and like, I can't believe how unlogical the world is. I can't believe they can s- believe so much untruth and they get, get so ranked that they can do all of this and it's going to mean anything. And we go through history and we say, man, everybody has done what is right in their own eyes and all it's done is destroyed things. And we sit here, and but we make sense of it not because we're any better than anybody else, but because of what God has done in us and for us. God has changed us. We're not like a metal coat hanger. Can we make sense of life? In fact, you know, the, uh, God basically carried this whole idea of vanity of vanity, all is vanity, everything is, is just nothing. It's useless, it's not meaningful. He carried that into the New Testament. You can read in Mark eight thirty six. he says, For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? What is the answer? Nothing you gain. I mean, nothing. You gain the whole world and it will be what? You can gain the whole world and yet it equals what? Nothing. Right? How about Romans 8.20? He goes on to tell us about Not only if we try to gain the whole world, it equals nothing, but what the earth is like. It says in Romans 8, 20 through 21, it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, the idea of nothingness. Not willingly, but because of him who subjugated it, in hope that the self will be set free from its bondage bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In other words, there is something wrong with creation. There is a vanity to all things going on and on and on and on, but one day Christ is going to redeem the creation himself. And MacArthur, right now, for something he said about 10, 15 years ago, when he said, hey, trying to save the world is just a vain thing. It's just going to all go away someday. Oh man, can you t- the humanists are just beside themselves. Paul gives a more graphic and specific thing concerning the vanity of life. In Philippians chapter 3, he's, he's going to go on, he's going to make this huge statement about how precious the treasure of Christ really is. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, he says this about his life and about Christ. He says, I count all things but loss... For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. According to Paul, life without Christ is not only vanity and worthless, 
it is dung. It's sewage. Right? Most of us around here have septic tanks. We know what sewage is. We don't like it when the septic tank backs up. Right? But that's what he's saying. All raw sewage. That's what he says. Life is like compared to Christ. Maybe you're single and you think marriage is going to solve your problem. No, it just compounds your problem. (laughs) Two imperfect people getting together. I mean, what could be better? Right? And you think that. You're like, oh, if I just get married, everything will be grand. Let me tell you, you just compounded everything. God is the answer. He's the only true and constant. He makes marriage one. It's a mystery how God can do that. I remember when we were planning to get married, and my mother-in-law was shaking her head, and it's like, you both talk too much. (laughs) I don't know how you're going to communicate. Well, now she understands. It just gets louder in our house. (laughs) So you might be married and you say, well, I married the wrong person. If I just get married to the right person, let me tell you, there are no right people. Right? Just look at the world we live in. There's only one true God. You might be thinking, I know my life will be better if I just get a different job. If I just have more money. If I just... Uh, you know, if I can just get a better job, some reason, if I can just do this and this and that. It's not. There's nothing perfect. Like, if I just had better parents. Well, let me tell you, your parents are just saying, if I had better kids, it goes, you see the circle of life? It's meaningless. There is nothing better than Christ. If you're not filled with Christ, then you have idolatry in your heart and you're trying to serve things that are meaningless. You know, someone once said, you might remember the the author of this, said only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Jim Elliott, you know, he died trying to share the gospel to the Aka Indians and he never got to see the gospel the fruition of it. He gave the gospel. He died for the gospel. He died for Christ. And now that group of Indians that, want, that killed him now proclaim Christ to all the other groups of tribal Indians in the whole Ecuadorian culture. You know, this one word, vanity, really opens up everything in, this, in, in the context of this book, but we can't build the entire thesis statement of the preacher of Solomon based on just this word. The truth is that there's a prepositional phrase. There's a, there's a phrase that shows up nearly 30 plus times. And you know the phrase, under the sun. Under the sun. The idea of this phrase is this, that life that is not being lived with a heavenly focus So when he says, under the sun, he's saying, I'm looking at life that's below heaven. And again, it's living life in a world without a focus of God, or the focus of heavenly things, without a focus of God. So it's everything that's below God. It's everything on a human level. Everything that's under the sun. It's beautiful, exactly the way that, that Rob explained it to us. That, uh, that sometimes we think we revolve around the sun, or everything revolves around the sun, and that's the way we see the world and the way they look. But that's not true. Everything is under the sun. And that is this idea. We can say under the sun is synonymous with man trying to figure out life and live life without God. His thinking never rises above the sun to heaven, but stays on this horizontal level. So the idea is is that life is all meaningless, and everything that we focus on that's under the sun has no true meaning. That's the, the combined thesis statement of the preacher. And you say, well, well, that's good. Why should we listen to the preacher? Why should we believe what he's saying? So let's look at the qualifications of the writer of Ecclesiastes. Think about it. Solomon had it all. 
if you really honestly think about it. He had position. Think of all the P's, right? Let's do a good alliteration here. He had the position, right, as the son of David, as the king of Israel. He had the power as the king. He had all the possessions. He had wealth, right? He had prestige. He had prominence. He had the pedigree. He had pleasure. He had all the pleasure known to man. And he had popularity. He had everything that almost everybody dreams about. And yet, in all of that, he says, it's meaningless. In fact, it was all handed to Solomon on a, on a silver platter. But you know what the one thing that eluded Solomon in all of that he had? Happiness. Think about it. In the end of his life, he was so far away from God, and he was miserable. As one writer said for Solomon, life seemed to be the emptiest and the poorest thing possible. Just then go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and listen to all that. By the, by the own admission of Solomon, verses 1 through 11, look at what Solomon says about himself. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart, oh, to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under the heavens during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools of which to water the, the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had slaves of whom were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I gathered together myself silver and of gold and of treasures, of kings and of provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, and, de and the delights of the Son of Man." So I became great, and I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, many, my wisdom remained with me. So in the very end, even when he wasn't following God, when he was following after all the pleasures of life, he still had the wisdom that God had given him. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toils, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and all the toil that I expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. What was the qualifications of the writer to discuss can we find meaning in life? He, had, he's probably the, he is unequivocally the most qualified person to explain. He's done it all. He's had it all. He's done it all. Wine, song, and dance. He has it. If we look at the context of 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon was given the wisdom of God. He was given the, he was the most wisest. And yet, in all of that wisdom, what did it get, it get him? Nothing. Solomon not only was the wisest man apart from Christ that had ever lived, Solomon had unequaled wealth. Unequaled, unparalleled. He had it all. Second Chronicles 1.15 explains that along with God's godly wisdom, God said, well, you didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for money. You didn't ha ask for all that, so I'll give it to you anyway. I think it's really for our, our understanding and our benefit. He had unequaled the yell, uh, wealth. Not only that, but Solomon had a historic pursuit of pleasure. You be, I don't know where you're at in your life, 
I don't know what your pursuit is. Maybe you're pursuing wisdom to try to understand everything going on in life. Maybe you're pursuing wealth and you're trying to, you're trying to figure out and how you can, if I just have enough money, then life will be easier. No, it just means that you have more for people to try to steal. <laughs> the earth has a way of going around and around in circles, right? My dad, I remember he made his first millions and then just shortly after he lost it. He made some more. He made another, some more millions. Not my, not my, not Barry in Canada, but <laughs> my other dad. Uh, it's, I know it's confusing. I've had three dads in my life. Uh, and he's got his money and he has wealth. And, he's, and he keeps gaining it, and then he loses it as fast, as fast as he gains it. That's wealth. Solomon had it, and yet, what did it do for him? Well, it allowed him to seek pleasure in a historic level. Maybe that's what you're, you want to just feel good. You're going after pleasure. If I have enough pleasure in my life, then it's going to transform my life. And, and, and uh, yes, I'm not going to deny that. It'll transform your life. It'll give you more headache. It'll give you more problems. Solomon is the most qualified and gifted person to speak to our need of understanding wh where the true meaning of life comes from. Ecclesiastes is really awesome. It's so great for us to study, to realize it tells us how Solomon sought to find joy, peace, and contentment in all that the world has to offer. But the more he sought happiness in the world, the more he realized it was just meaningless. Today we really were just seeing the scratching the surface of his personal experiences. But we don't want to ignore the testimony that he gives us. He wanted to communicate, what he wanted to communicate was not a message of pessimism or, oh no, there's nothing, oh, we just should give up, nor was it an attempt to glorify a life of wandering away from God. He wanted to communicate very simply that apart from God, everything under the sun, apart from God being at the center of your life, no matter where you go, no matter what you achieve, what you strive for, it will leave you empty. You need a relationship with God. A relationship with God is the only thing that makes sense in this world. His word, God's word, his life will make sense of that which is meaningless. But if you do not have a right relationship with God, you're not, and if you don't have an intent on obeying God, the following his word, then life will seem empty. I can't tell you how many people go to church and they say, you know, Pastor, I've gone to church for a while, and I just can't make sense of it. It doesn't do anything for me. It's meaningless. Well, that's true. Without a relationship with God, if you are not, remember the, the first commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are you doing that? Because a relationship with God is the only thing that makes meaning out of life. Jesus said that, right? John 10.10. 10. I have come that you may have life. Without Christ, we have no life. And you know, then have it abundantly. Jesus is a unique and, and powerful because he alone opens up the way of life to us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the life. There's no meaning in life apart from Christ. You see, if you go to the very end of your notes, you'll see this. The story of the Bible is essentially this. If we look at God's word and you read through it from page, you know, from page one to page whatever, thousands down the road, you go from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see this. The story of the Bible is, is this, is men and women trying to put ourselves in the place of, that's the reality. That's the story of the Bible. When you look at it, everyone is trying to put themselves in the place of God. That's what Ecclesiastes shows us. He did everything to promote himself. 
And of course, Paul tells us that everything in life is rubbish compared to Christ. We're trying to troll in our hearts are rebellious, and we say that our way is better than God's way, that, that, we, that we really be, should become God of everything. You just look at evolution. You look at where science is, is done, and, what is, and it's polluted the truth of who God really is. And now they trust theory over you know, what the definition of science is, observable facts. Well, now they believe theory that they cannot observe over fact. And they say that the theory is more important than the fact. That's mankind putting themselves in place of God. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is our life we earn. If the verse stopped there, death, it all ends in Nothing. But yet we know that death isn't nothing because death is just puts us before God having to give an account for our life and we are judged and then thrown into the lake of fire if we don't have Christ. The wages of sin is death. That's, that's the story of the Bible, but it doesn't end there. That's not the end, right? But the gift of God is eternal life through what? Jesus Christ our Lord. The part two of the, the story of the Bible is this, is that God puts himself in the place of man. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love. If you know 1 John 4, it tells us that God is love, that the very essence of God is love. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation. That's a big word for the, he stood in between to take all of the wrath so that way we didn't have to take it. It's like going on the battlefield and, and facing an, you, know, you against ten thousands or hundreds of thousands in an army. It's impossible. You are going to be crushed. But God sent his son to go in between to put himself in the place of man. And he took the full brunt of God's wrath. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him that we might become the righteousness of God. He took all of our sin. He became our propitiation. He became our go-between, the, the stand-in, to take the full brunt of God's wrath on sin. Not just your sin, but the sin of the whole world. As we look at Ecclesiastes, I think it's important to listen to the preacher. Not me. Listen. He knows what he's talking about. And he's saying, look, stop trying to take the place of God in life and let God take the place of you in life so that way he can make sense of your life for you. And we have a great God. That's why that's the good news. That's the gospel. God took your place. He didn't just... He provided you salvation. He made you who were dead in sin alive through Christ, giving you the, His Spirit to understand that you need Him. Where are you in this story? Are you still trying to grasp for the wind? Are you grasping? Are you finding that you just... No matter what you grab a hold on in life, it just seems like nothing. It's a never-ending battle to grasp. You're not getting anywhere. Oh, yeah, you may, you know, you may get a new job. You may have gotten more money. You may, you may, something may have happened in your life, but yet you still feel empty. Stop taking the place of God. Let God take your place. Only a relationship with God will make sense out of anything. Can we make sense out of life? No. But God can. That's the true nature of Ecclesiastes. I just, it, it, I, hope, I hope you go home and dive into this because I hope it opens your eyes to how great God truly is. All we have is Christ. That is such a beautiful song. I love that song. It's one of my favorite songs. I have a bunch of favorite songs. That's one of them. 
right? I was lost. I didn't know the way. But Christ came in to show me. All I have is Christ. I hope that is true in your life. If that's not, it's not too late. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Recognize that you are nothing and that life is nothing. Lay yourself before the cross and say, the wages of sin in my life is death. I know that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May you truly respond to the gift that he's given you and come to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this study. And as we answer this question and as we look at Ecclesiastes, I pray that the study will bring great joy through learning about you, knowing you. Lord, I pray that right now if somebody, somebody in the body has been putting a lot of faith in things or stuff or in the reality of government in our world, if, if that's what brings stability in our life and it's coming crashing down around them and they realize that it's just nothing, Lord, whatever it is that they would grasp firmly upon you, that they would reach out onto the rock and say that you are my strength. You are my foundation. You are the everlasting God. You are the God who cares. You're the God that makes sense out of life. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's a part of the family of God here that's just struggling, that you bless them, encourage them, and that they would see that they simply just have to grasp onto their relationship with you to make sense of it all. It doesn't mean that they're not going to feel pain or struggle. They're, 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 it doesn't take all the struggle, but you make sense out of it. You give purpose. You give understanding. You give light. You light the way. You go before us and make the path straight so we get through the problem. You remove obstacles. You train us. You teach us how to climb over them and reach for you. Lord, I pray that today that that would be all of our desires to firmly, during this time of struggle, we would cling to you and not to any other thing that we remove all idols and just say Lord you are everything Lord I, I would be remiss maybe somebody here has just never grasped you they never called out to you they never found the rock that is sure that we've talked about for the last few months the God who is everything and they, they're really struggling and they've realized that you are everything and that this morning that they would it's simple that they would just realize that we our life is nothing but Lord you are everything that in your love that while we were yet sinners you died for us you, to take our place to be our stand and to be our go between you became us so that way we can be right in your eyes. Lord, we can't be right without you. So Lord, I pray that if someone here needs to do that, that they would do that right now. That they would confess you as Lord and call out to you for their salvation from their sin and begin this new relationship to be adopted into the family of God. Lord, I pray that we could adopt many in this day of turmoil, that you would give us fruit, that you would prepare us to share the good news of what you've done for us. May we be useful in your hands, Lord, today. We just thank you so much for your work. May we cling to it because it never fails. Thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless fear. To this I hold. to his oh how
how strange and divine I can see all is mine yet no I but through Christ in me when the night is dark but I am not forsaken Oh, by my side The Savior, He will stay I lay on In weakness, in rejoicing For oh, my need His power is displayed To this I hold My Shepherd will defend Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold my hope. Father, may that be our desire today to live for you and only for you and not for our own pleasures. As we continue opening this beautiful book of Ecclesiastes, uh, I pray, Lord, just like at the end of the book says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. I consider all of us, we're still young until we get to see you. So as we are still alive in this flesh, may we remember you, not just here at church, Every single morning when we open our, our eyes, maybe even when our eyes not even open, help us to remember you and to consider your ways and live in them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A wonderful afternoon, another beautiful sunny day before the rain. So the Lord bless you. And, uh, so if you want to stay around for fellowship, yep, just wear your mask or go outside. <laughs>